Well, go ahead and start. Christ is risen from the dead by death trampling down the on death and to those in the tombs he has granted life. Amen. Thank you. Christ is risen. So we'll pick up now. We've um, we've talked about the preparation that the clergy do, their entrance prayers, the prayers that they say as they put on their vestments for the divine liturgy, the preparation of the bread and the wine, the prosumiti. We talked a little bit last time about church architecture. Now we're going to start jumping into the text of the Divine Liturgy itself. Um, I make no promises as to how quickly or how slowly we will go through this. I, I find myself just wanting to read the entire couple of commentaries I have to you, and I have to stop myself from doing that. So if I get bogged down on a point for too long, say, all right, we get the point, buddy, move on. Um, <laughs> But, uh, um, but there's a lot to say because there is so much uh, that is packed into the Divine Liturgy in every, uh, every word, every part, every piece, every action. So as we've talked a little bit about uh, in the past, there are three sections to the Divine Liturgy. So there are these preparatory rites that we've already talked about, the entrance prayers, the vesting, the prosumidi. The second part is called the Liturgy of the Catechumens, also sometimes called Liturgy of the Word. And so this is the part from the beginning of the liturgy to the dismissal of the catechumens, which we generally don't do in our liturgies anymore. So you could really say from the beginning of the liturgy to the great entrance. Okay. And then the Liturgy of the Faithful is the third part, um, which could also be called the Liturgy of the Eucharist. And this is from the small litany of the faithful. So, you know, how after the gospel and after the homily, the deacon in our church at least will turn around and say, again and again in peace, let us pray to the Lord. Help us, save us, have mercy on us, protect us, O God, by your grace, wisdom. The priest says a prayer. And then we have the great entrance. So from there until the very end of the liturgy is that third section. Okay. Those divisions make sense. Um, the, it, quite simply, it's called the Liturgy of the Catechumens because that was the part of the liturgy that those preparing for baptism would attend. And then at some point after the gospel, the catechumens were dismissed. And we still see this in the pre-sanctified liturgy, right? There's that part where the deacon proclaims, catechumens depart, depart catechumens, all catechumens depart, let none of the catechumens remain. Only the faithful again and again in peace, let us pray to the Lord. When he says that, only the faithful, O CPC, that's the beginning of the liturgy of the faithful now, right? Um, and those petitions were originally in the divine liturgy itself, not just in pre-sanctified liturgy. And if you go to monasteries, if you go to Russia, they tend to still do those petitions. You'll still hear them in um, a, a lot of the Orthodox traditions around. So that's why I put this division in there. But because generally you're not going to hear in a typical Greek or Arab church, um, catechumens depart, OCPST, only the faithful, you could really just say the beginning to the great entrance or just before the great entrance and then from the prayer before the great entrance until the end. All right. Does that make sense? Is that too much detail? <laughs> um, all right. I find... You see depictions of this often, showing the Christ child on the altar or on the discos himself. Many saints have had various visions at different times during the prosumidi or during the divine liturgy where they see the lamb changed into the Christ child, which is an incredibly powerful you know, moment and image. Right? So yeah, the, this represents the altar. Did you have a question? Or? He's always the lamb. No, change to a Christ child. Well, yeah, we so the lamb is what we call the piece of bread. Right. 
that will be consecrated and become communion. Mm -hmm. And so many, many priests throughout the ages have had visions where they see that piece of bread turn into the Christ child himself uh, before the very eyes. Um, and so you'll see that depicted in icons at different times. Um, so when does this really kick off? We talked, I think, a little bit at one point how actually just before what you see as the beginning of the liturgy, there's a dialogue that takes place between the deacon and the bishop or the priest that is celebrating. And you'll see this if you come at the beginning of, of services, at the end of the doxology, when they start singing the Trisagion, Agios Sophios, Agios Iskiros, you'll see that at one point I'll motion with my orarion and then I kneel down and the priest begins to bless me. That's what this dialogue is. And it's before I go out, but it's actually... So it's up in the altar. So it's up in the altar. Well, it's up in the altar if it's a presbyter, if it's a priest. Okay. Okay. If it's the bishop, it's taking place at the throne. Oh, okay. So after he goes to the throne, you'll hear me, you know, exchanging this dialogue okay. with him. So most right. commonly we would see this. Mostly in, in the altar, exactly. And the first thing that I say is, <clears throat> it is time for the Lord to act. Okay, this is a, a quote from Psalm 118, 126. Keros tu piise to kirio. It's time for the Lord to act. Right? And it's important to know, at one point in John, during his ministry, Christ says, my time has not yet fully come. And this time he's referring to is the time of the cross and the resurrection. And so what is the time of the Lord for him to act? It is the cross and the resurrection. This is a proclamation that we are entering into the mystery of Christ's death and his resurrection. It is time for the Lord to act. When did Christ, the Lord, o Kyrios, right, um, Adonai, when did he act? It is in the cross and the resurrection. But it's also the time of the glory to come. This is the day of the Lord, the day of Yahweh, described in the prophets. We've been talking about this in Bible study. This is the day when the Lord is prophesied by the prophets to come, to establish justice on the earth, and to establish his kingdom. This is the time for the Lord to act, and all of these things are present. That is the mystery that we are entering into in the Divine Liturgy. Right? The other thing to note is this word, um, piise, is um, from this word piel, which in Greek is also used for the word to create. Um, we use it in the creed, for example, when we talk about him being the creator of heaven and earth. It's using that same root. Um, it's also the root of the word poet. And so there's an idea here that his work is the recreation of all things, including us. We are being renewed and recreated fully in his image and his likeness. And it is an act of art and of beauty just like a poet might. Right? All of this is contained in this notion that it is time for the Lord, we could say, to act, to do, to make, to recreate, and to make beautiful. And so this is the instruction. In that moment, the deacon speaks on behalf of all of the people. It is time for the Lord to act. And in response, the priest says, um, oh, 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 before I get to uh, what the priest will say in response, St. John of Kronstadt refers to this. He says, the divine liturgy is truly a heavenly service upon earth, during which God himself, in a particular, immediate, and most close manner, is present and dwells with men, being himself the invisible celebrant of the service, offering and being offered. There is nothing upon earth holier, higher, grander, more solemn, more life-giving than the liturgy. Christ is the one acting. God himself acts. He is the priest. 
He is the priest, he is the victim, he is the, the altar, and he is the one who receives the, the offering. The temple at this particular time becomes an earthly heaven. Those who officiate represent Christ himself, the angels, the cherubim, seraphim, and apostles. By the way, bishop, uh, the deacons, and the priests. Right, according to the to what uh, Saint Ignatius of Antioch writes in the beginning of the second century, the liturgy is the continually repeated solemnization of God's love to mankind and of His all-powerful mediation for the salvation of the whole world and of every member separately. The marriage of the Lamb, the marriage of the King's Son, in which the Bride of the Son of God is every faithful soul, and the Giver of the Bride is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit prepares us and offers us to Christ the Bridegroom. With what prepared, pure, elevated souls it is therefore necessary to assist at the liturgy, in order not to be amongst the number of those who, having no wedding garment, but a garment defiled by passions, were bound hand and foot and cast out of the marriage feast into utter darkness. While now, unfortunately, many do not even consider it necessary to assist at the liturgy at all, Others only go out of habit and go away in the same state of mind as they came, without elevated thoughts, without a contrite heart, with an unrepentant soul, without the determination to amend. What an incredible vision of what is occurring in the divine liturgy and what we are doing and, and what we are entering into. <clears throat> so the priest says on behalf of, I'm sorry, the deacon says on behalf of the people, it is time for the Lord to act. It is time for this to occur. And the priest says then, blessed is our God always, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Right? We bless the God who is now beginning to act. At which point the priest then, the deacon rather than says, pray for me, Master. The priest says, may the Lord guide your steps to every good work. The deacon responds, remember me, Master. He says, may the Lord our God remember you in his kingdom always now and forever and under the ages of ages. So with the title. Then that's when you'll see me come out of the altar. The deacon goes to his place in the Soleil, and the priest and the deacon will together three times bow, saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill to men. We then say twice, O Lord, you will open my lips and my mouth shall declare your praise. This line from the Psalms where we ask God to now open our mouths as the clergy to be able to proclaim his praise and to do this work. Where we say, standing in the temple of your glory, we feel as though in heaven. O Theotokos, heavenly gate, open for us the door of your mercy. Mm -hmm. She is the gate to heaven. We are asking, open the gate, the gate, right? Well. Open the gate and allow us to enter. Allow this physical place that we are to be the temple of your holy. Um, it's it's this fascinating moment. I mean, while so this part in particular is going on during that final <clears throat> um, hymn in praise of the resurrection at the end of the doxology, and it seems almost like an afterthought. You see, it's just kind of bowing, but in reality, what we're proclaiming to ourselves most especially is this is what we are doing and this is what we are accomplishing. So this is like you're quietly <clears throat> saying these prayers. We can't mm -hmm. necessarily hear what you're saying. And the chanting is still going on. Mm -hmm. This is like the end of Orthros. Right. Okay. Right. Exactly. So we have a tendency to be like, blessed is the kingdom. Mm -hmm. There, it started. Right. But right. actually, it started right. here. The Lord's already acting. Okay. Right. He's already starting to do something. We've, we've asked him to come and to begin to work. And now what you see us doing is... The deacon humbles himself and asks for the prayers and the blessing of the cylinder. And, and then we are, so you may recall in the proscomity, the priest begins the prayer, blessed is our God, always now and ever, and under the ages of ages. Amen. The first thing he does is make the sign of the cross with the lance, with the spear, over the, the loaf of bread says, in remembrance of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ. Right? Because Christ says, do this in remembrance of me. 
And so the first thing he does is remind himself and everyone, what are we doing? We are doing this in remembrance of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ. Here we say, Lord, act. And the first thing that we then say is, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill to men. This is what the, the divine liturgy is. It is a glorification of God and the coming of his peace, which is his kingdom on earth, right? So we're reminding ourselves again three times what we are doing as we go about to begin the divine liturgy. Does that make sense? It's a, it's a pattern that you're seeing occur. Every time we start, the first thing that we then do is remind ourselves, what are we about here? What are we doing? Um, so you said this is a doxology, or this, it's before? This is happening during the doxology. Mm -hmm. So is it um, when the, um, it's before the, the actual liturgy starts? Right. Before blessed is the kingdom, before holy men, this is going on while the chanters are singing the doxology. Father and I are having this dialogue together. Um, in a bit, when a bishop serves, what you'll see is during the doxology, he comes out, all the clergy come out, and he goes to the throne. And then standing at the throne, we're finishing orthros, and then once orthros is done, we begin this. So I haven't talked about finishing orthros, and I'm not going to until we talk about orthros. But there's, there are pieces of orthros that um, we publicly skip when we're celebrating divine liturgy. But in reality, what's going on is the deacon and the priest do them quietly in the altar so that the doxology leads directly into liturgy because it seems to be a fitting tie-in, right? Um, so those things are going on first. We close out Orthros privately. And then this dialogue begins and we move into the, to the dialogue of liturgy. I didn't want to blur... I want to make, you know, in a sense, I want to make sure that Orthos and liturgies are understood as being two very different services, right? There are days where we don't celebrate the liturgy. We always celebrate Orthos. So there's not a single day where, in the year where Orthos is not appointed, right? We don't always do it in our churches, um, unfortunately. Most churches in Greece, you will find Orthos every day, or most days even if they're not doing liturgy. And you'll see Father Nico will sometimes put Orthros on the calendar even without divine liturgy, right? And part of that is him trying to educate and make the point. Not into that. Right. Orthros is its own thing, appointed every day. It's a good thing, it's a wonderful thing, but Orthros is one thing and the divine liturgy is another thing, right? Um, is that making sense, kind of what's going on? Bells will ring during right. the doxology. Right. The right. Yeah. And right. I remember my mother telling me, um, it's the bells of the doxology. Uh, <laughs> get up, we're late. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And they do that at the monastery too. You'll hear during the doxology, the bells start ringing. Huh. Um, yeah. 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 Um, it's a. Uh, so this isn't exactly with the picture, but you'll see when the bishop's at the throne during this moment, I come around in front of him, I'm usually holding that candle, and I'll bow, and he's blessing me twice, usually, saying these prayers before I go out to the middle as we move to begin. We may not get to it yet, but it is noteworthy that the bishop is at the throne, and he sends a priest into the altar to start at this point, and the bishop doesn't himself go into the altar until later. There's actually a, that's a, a very important um, uh, remnant of historically what's going on in these times. We'll get to that. Um, all right, is this making sense, this dialogue here at the start? So then, we begin, blessed is the kingdom of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, always now and forever into the ages of ages. Amen. Um, this is the blessing that begins sacramental liturgical services. Okay. Now, I do need to 
to point one because what you'll notice is the orthros and vespers start with a different blessing. Blessed is our God, always now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Practices, things like this. Um, a vigil and the main body of orthros actually begins with um, glory to the holy consubstantial and life creating trinity. Always now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. You'll hear on Pascha when we went outside, right? Um, and Father reads that proclamation gospel, and then what is the first thing he does? He holds up the candle and he says, Glory to the holy consubstantial and life creating Trinity, always now and under and under the ages of ages. Amen. He's starting Orthros. Wow. Wow. And then we begin singing Christos and Esti and everything else. That's Orthros, right? Um, the blessed is the kingdom is unique now to divine liturgy, baptisms. Uh, weddings and the unction service. Okay. Um, originally, what happened is uh, originally blessed is the kingdom is how they started all services in Constantinople, vespers, orthros, etc. But over time, they started to realize that it made sense for this blessed is the kingdom to really refer to sacramental services. And so it, it changed over time. So it's not just Eucharistic, but it is sacramental. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, and as um, Hiram Gregory begins, he says that we begin the divine liturgy with a threefold miracle. So as we're saying, blessed is the kingdom, the priest is making the sign of the cross mm -hmm. over specifically the antimension. And we'll talk about what that is in just a moment. Okay. But this little red cloth. He's making the sign of the cross with the gospel book as he says this, okay? And so there's a threefold proclamation of the miracle in that moment. First is the cross itself. The second is uh, the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons and one God. The third miracle is the very fact that we know this, right? The fact that he has revealed himself to us in this way because we don't know that otherwise right only because he has revealed himself to us are we able to know this and to say this right so that in itself is a miracle um, Saint Yermanos of Constantinople because the rites performed in the divine liturgy are a sacramental initiation into the incarnation of the Lord it is necessary for the Holy Trinity to shine forth and be proclaimed from the very beginning of the Divine Liturgy. We begin with this proclamation of our triune God. St. John Chrysostom asks, What is the kingdom of God? Christ replies, It is my presence. Christ appears in the mysteries themselves. So what is this kingdom that we are proclaiming and blessing? But it is Christ himself. It is the fact that we are in his presence really and truly just as much as if we were standing at the foot of the cross or in the empty tomb right. um, the symbol of that kingdom is the cross itself a number of the saints make the point first of all we need to be there when this is proclaimed so that we can make that sign of the cross, that symbol of the kingdom, ourselves in that very moment, so that we too appropriate for ourselves and enter into that kingdom, right? Into that presence. Um, and they, rec they say specifically, make the sign of the cross very intentionally in that moment, right? Yes, every time we make the sign of the cross, we should make it intentionally, but especially in that moment when we are proclaiming that we are entering into this kingdom. And this is the symbol. And it's not just that the cross is the symbol of the kingdom. It is the means of entry into the kingdom. It is only through our death with Christ and resurrection with him in baptism. It is only through our picking up our cross and following him every day. It is only in, as St. Paul says, dying daily with Christ and in him and to the world and to ourselves 
that we enter into that kingdom. And so it's only fitting that the first action, the first public action of the divine liturgy is to make the sign of the cross. This is how we begin. Now I mentioned the antimensium, um, that, that red cloth which when unfolded, antimensium means basically instead of the table. So um, it is a piece of cloth that on it is usually depicted the burial of Christ. Okay, burial of Christ in the cross. Um, and many times, although not always, sewn into it are actually relics of the martyrs and the saints. Okay? Just like the altar would be itself. It becomes a mini altar. Um, yeah, it will often be sewed in. My guess is that's what we're looking at right over there. You know, Not always now. They don't always have relics in them, but generally they will. And maybe most importantly, what they will have is the signature of your bishop in ink, signed when it was consecrated. So they usually consecrate these when they consecrate a new church. And they pour um, chrism oil onto the altar, anointing the altar of the church. And then what they will do is they wipe the chrism off of the altar using all the antimensi that they're consecrating. Um, and then the bishop, either right before or right after that liturgy, will actually sign that antimensium. So this is one uh, I found online, signed by Archbishop of Philipotomus. Ours is signed by Metropolitan Erasmus. You may not, under any circumstances in the church, celebrate the divine liturgy without serving it on the antimensium signed by your hierarch. Okay. Because it is the authorization from your bishop on whose behalf you serve to be celebrating divine liturgy in this place. Right. And no joke, every time I'm serving in, another, in a church, what you'll see is Bishop Ioannis as the chancellor will check the antimensium. Make sure, one, that it's in good shape, and two, make sure that it is signed by Erasmus. We actually, I won't say where, but I was serving with him one time, uh, not long ago, and he opens up the Antimension, and it was signed by Anthony, I think, Metropolitan Anthony. It's been a while ago. And it's been a long time. It was in pretty <coughs> poor shape, too. And he looked at it, and he just about had a, Bishop Yohan, he's just about a meltdown. He's like, you've been celebrating divine liturgy uncanonically for a long time. And he said, I've got an antimension in my car right now. Fold this up, put this away, I'm getting you a new antimension. And like right there on the spot, that's how seriously they take this, right? Because it means our, not just our unity as a parish, it mm -hmm. means we're unified with with, under church. our bishop, with, with our hierarchs, and, right. and with their blessing. It's not just right. us free ranging. So right. when there's a new bishop, uh, he has to come and sign it? What, what the new bishop will do, one of the first actions that he will do is consecrate a whole bunch of new antimensia and sign all of them, and a new antimensia is sent to every parish in the entire metropolis. Yeah, I mean, it's done like real quick. Um, because, you, yeah, and, and you, doesn't matter how new your Antimension is, it gets put aside, and you immediately begin using the new one from your new bishop. You know, it's, and, I mean, it's one of the ways, you know, in ancient times, you couldn't necessarily, um, communication wasn't very good. One of the ways to know whether this church was a proper church or it was a heretical church, or a schismatic church, or something, was to check the signature on the Antimension. Who's your bishop, right? And it, it isn't just a take your word for it, mm -hmm. it's a show me the actual signed Antimension that proves who your bishop is. Um, you know, sometimes they're in color, some are nicer, you know, fancier than others, some are a little bit bigger than others. But, but the point is, and you know, ours 
specifically has that ink signature from Metropolitan Unasimus. Um, and so, and it, where does this come from? Does anyone have a guess as to where this, this particular piece of cloth may have originated? There's a hint. There is something on top of our altar table right now, which was placed there at the end of the lamentation service, and will stay there until the Feast of Ascension. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So the cloth itself is actually the epitaphius, right? Not the kubukleon, which is the, the thing. The cloth itself is the epitaphius. And that's where this originally comes from. Okay. It right? reminds me. Yeah. So, so this is supposed yeah. to remind you of. Like, right. Yeah. Originally, it was essentially an epitaphios. And that, you know, became just sort of the standard thing. But you'll notice we still put the epitaphios on the altar mm -hmm. for 40 days after Pascha. So there's a, yeah, there's a very clear connection between those. Um, in fact, the ayir, which is the, the cloth placed over the gifts, which the deacon is placed around the deacon's shoulders during oh, the great entrance, okay. that used to be the epitaphios as well. Oh, okay. So the epitaphios will be put over oh. your, your, your shoulders. That rests on his shoulders. So that's sort of Simon of, Simon of Cyrene-ish almost. Yeah. yeah. Huh, wow. <laughs> Home Sunday liturgy fun and Nico hands me the Tuscos. The first thought was, oh look, he's riding a donkey again. Anyway. Um, all right, make Atomension makes sense. This gets we'll talk later about when this gets unfolded in the Divine Liturgy. Um, but you'll see, like, you know, part of it too, it has a very functional purpose, which is that it collects all of the particles of what we actually call pearls of the Holy Eucharist that might fall off of the, the discos as we prepare. So that's why you see me and Father taking care to try and pick up all of those particles in this liturgy. Um, funny story, I was celebrating, so I had only been ordained just over a month, and I'm serving liturgy at Ascension Cathedral for their feast day. And the deacon's job is to prepare the gifts and then clean up the, the atomensium. So I'm doing this, and his eminence is standing behind me, and I hear him clearing his throat. And so I think that's him telling me, yeah, right, get, get on with it, like hurry up, I'm ready to distribute communion, let's go. So I rush throw the communion cloth on, I'm trying to be obedient, right? I'm nervous, I, you know, I haven't done this much. Um, and uh, at the end of the liturgy, he says, Father Deacon, I have an observation. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yes, your eminence. <laughs> you know, they come over, and he moves the gospel over, and opens up the Antimensium, and he says, you've left far too many pearls in this Antimensium. So let me show you how I clean the ultimate so, And he, showed, he was very gentle, very <laughs> sweet about it. He was very clear. He was like, this isn't going to, you know, you can't do this. And um, I thought, okay, well, lesson learned. He's just clearing his throat. <laughs> <laughs> when you're clearing your throat, you're just clearing so your throat. just clearing your throat. <laughs> anyway, I learned my lesson. Uh, so, um, all right. We say in response this Hebrew word, Amen. Um, it means truly, indeed, let it be so. Right? St. Nicholas Cavasula says, The faithful conclude with Amen, and thus make everything, boy, my typo was so bad tonight, I'm sorry. <laughs> and thus make everything that the priest says their own. Mm -hmm. What is lacking in the perfection of the priest is completed by the action of the people. Mm -hmm. And God accepts the least with the greatest in one unity of spirit. Okay. This is so important. The Amen especially of all of the responses in the liturgy should not just be one chanter. The Amen is for the entire people of God. 
St. Jerome says that when liturgy was celebrated in the chapel of Christ's birth in Bethlehem in the 5th century, that the Amen was so loud it sounded like a thunderclap. The people responded Amen so loud it was like thunder. We participate in the Divine Liturgy through that Amen. You often hear, right, the priest cannot celebrate liturgy without at least one other person there to say Amen. Mm -hmm. right? And this is why, according to St. Nicholas of Oslis, the people are making up for what is lacking in the priest's own imperfections. There is a unity of spirit present. The priest needs the people to make up for what is lacking in himself. And together, as one united body of Christ, we offer this worship. Um, we don't need to shout it, but we should say it enthusiastically and understand. We are giving our consent and making our own what the priest has just said. So, um, any questions about the opening exclamation? That's as far as we've gotten so far. Um, all right. So this opening section in Narcissus, um, which is three litanies with three antiphons, right? Three selections from the Psalms and so on. In Constantinople, in the early days as this liturgy was developing, um, there, the, liter the, the street, the streets of the city became the, the narthex almost of the church in a sense, right? In that the liturgy actually began in procession from the bishop's house to the cathedral or to whatever church they were going to be celebrating liturgy in that day. So the walk to church okay. was part of the church. The walk to church was part of the church. Did it together. Right. <laughs> and what they did during that walk to the church was to pray a liturgical unit, you might call, which were the three antiphons. Right. The first one being through the prayers of the Theotokos, Savior, save us. The second one being, um, uh, save us, O Son of God, we sing to you. Or actually, it was really, well, yeah, really it was um, uh, through the intercessions of your saints, Savior, save us. And the third was, save us, O Son of God, who are wondrous in your saints, or who rose from the dead, we sing to you, Alleluia. Those were the three refrains to sections of psalm verses, okay? Um, they were punctuated with three stops at which the deacon would say a litany. Okay. And so this was the ancient procession to the church, which then began with what we now would call the small entrance. So you would literally, right. like literal stops, like you're walking and then you literally stop. stopping. And the deacon does something yep. and you're all paused and then you keep going. And then going you continue the as you sing. Ah, okay. And if you've ever noticed, every procession that we do still liturgically follows the same pattern. Ah. When we do the lamentation service walking around, what do we do? We there pause yeah. multiple times, okay. <laughs> four times. The deacon does a litany and then we proceed, okay. right? I didn't know it was like we're catching up. Or yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, what we're doing, I know it's hard because the trail is long. We're actually stopping and I'm doing a litany. Mm -hmm. And in the same way, um, the litany with the, the procession with the icons, uh, the procession with yeah. the cross and the third Sunday of, of Lent. In those processions, what are we doing? I, we're stopping and doing litanies in different spots, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. This was the way that you did a procession in Constantinople, and we still do it. And the beginning of the liturgy still has those traces, right? And we'll get in, in the more in-depth in those in a little bit. Um, but the, what we now call the small entrance is actually when they would be entering the church itself, okay? So when the, when the gospel book is brought out. 
And we'll and we'll 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 look at that more in depth because the prayers for that make it clear where this is coming from and what's going on, right? Because otherwise it makes no sense to pick up the gospel book, walk outside, and then walk right back in and put it right back where it was. Yeah, yeah. Right? That doesn't make a lot of logical sense. But in reality, what's going on is it's a remnant of this older order, all of which you still see in the Divine Liturgy of St. James that we occasionally celebrate, right? That order is preserved there um, so that you can see it, okay? Um, so, but I, I, I just wanted to sort of, this is sort of like just the overview of that first section from after blessed is the kingdom to the small entrance. What's going on here? This unit is there. The reason it's there um, is, I mean, quite simply, as the, the proscomity was developing. So in these ancient liturgies, what happened is there was this procession to the church, and you went in, you're singing these during this time. During the great entrance, the deacons would actually go into this adjoining room and do the proscomity themselves. And then process it back, process it into the church now prepared. Okay. Um, the cherubic hymn was actually probably an antiphonal song sung multiple times with verses of psalms in between, which gives you an idea of how long that process kind of took, right? It was a pretty drawn out process. Over time, on days when there was not going to be a big procession from the bishop's house to the church, and they were having divine liturgy, the priests started preparing the proscomity before the great entry, or before before liturgy started, and they would have them start singing the three antiphon service while he was doing the proscomity as a way to sort of fill time, mm. right? In the same way that like you might go to a Russian church and they'll do the third and sixth hours while you're doing proskomedi. Here we do orthros while you're doing proskomedi, right? In those times what they did was they would do the three antiphons while you did the proskomedi. Mm -hmm. And eventually they stopped doing processions from the bishop's house to the church altogether because all of a sudden Hagia Sophia is not a cathedral anymore. And so it becomes kind of crystallized then in that form where you're doing this, this preface part now in the church without walking around. Okay. Um, but there's still room for it. I, I remember attending a liturgy one time at a, a little monastery on Palm Sunday, where on that day we would all gather outside and the, the abbot proclaimed blessed is the kingdom outside. Hmm. And then we walked around the church, stopping and singing the antiphons for Palm Sunday, holding our palm branches and stopping in the appropriate place, and then got to the main entrance of the church and all walked in at the small entrance. So we kind of recreated this a little bit, um, hmm. and, and that can be done. Okay. Which gets us to the litany of peace, or the great litany, which is this first grand litany um, that kicks off the divine liturgy. Um, as as Hiram Gregory says, the road to the divine liturgy is peace of soul. Okay. St. Isaac the Syrian says, the more the heart ceases to be disturbed by recollections of external things, the more the intellect is astounded by understanding divine things. St. Basil says, true peace is from above. St. John Chrysostom Clerk, you know, brings it all together. This mystery, meaning the divine liturgy, is a mystery of peace. For the divine liturgy is our encounter with Christ, who is the true peace for man. So we, you are praying a whole list of prayers that we're joining in on. This is the first big list of prayers. Right. And the focus of these prayers is peace. I guess I never noticed before that you sang it over. Yeah. Please let us raise the Lord. Right. Yeah. Right. And you right. and you pray for I'm just looking at the text yeah. for peace from above, for the peace of yep. the whole world. So what so I think of it as like the prayer list. Right. Here's all the people we're praying for, right. all the beings, but we're also praying for 
piece of relationship. We start world. with that. Exactly. Ah, okay. So the foundation of validity is, is the our peace of Christ. Of peace. Exactly. Okay. Um, and the peace okay. he brings. In peace let us pray for, to the Lord. For the peace from above and for the salvation of our souls. For the peace of the whole world and for the unity of all. Hmm. Right? For this holy house and for those who enter it. For pious and orthodox Christians, for Archbishop Erasmus, for the civil authorities. For this city, every city and parish, for favorable weather, for those who travel, the sick, the suffering, the captives. For our deliverance from all affliction, around danger, and necessity, help us save us and mercy us, protect us. And then commemorating, commemorating all the saints, we commit ourselves to Christ, right? So, yeah, the foundation of all of this is the peace that comes from above, which is Christ. So we're not just praying, like, we want to have nice weather, mm -hmm. we hope people don't get sick. We're right. praying for peace in the natural world around us. Exactly. We're praying for peace in people's bodies, for peace in prisons. Ah, uh, okay. Because, and, oops, let's see if I can get this. Um, huh. No, this is not working. Hold on. I was going to say. So, because what do we respond back? We say, Lord, have mercy. Mm -hmm. God's mercy is the force of the divine kingdom itself. Right? Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. And so we ask for mercy first and foremost, above all, right? And when we ask for God's mercy, we are asking for his kingdom to break through and reign over and incorporate all of these things. Mm -hmm. And that's why our prayer at all times and for all of these things is mercy, right? And so his, um, right, the, it is the mystery of peace. Christ is true peace for man. And in his peace, in him, we ask for the action, the divine action of his kingdom to be incorporated into all these things, right? So we're not just asking for, um, you know, like you said, nice weather, for, you know, go a good well. government, right. things to go well. What we're saying is, let the action of your kingdom break through into all of these things. First and foremost with your peace, the mm -hmm. peace from above. But then let your kingdom break through and establish itself in all of these ways and let all of these things be in your kingdom. Right? And from a Protestant mind, when I when we hear Lord have mercy, it mm -hmm. tends to sound like don't hit us. Right. <laughs> like, well, exactly. We don't need exactly. that. Let's, let's right. Start, it, it sounds right. it sounds to to a Protestant mind. Right. I feel like right. it sounds like don't. It's don't, sort of like don't you know the, the game like, Uncle, don't right? Don't it's like we would say mercy, yes. right? You play mercy, oh, the mercy like, wrestling, like, don't right? Hit me. Yeah. But that's not what we yeah. mean. <laughs> You're gonna dislocate my arm. Stop. Mercy, mercy, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's no. it's so much more, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether the etymology is really correct, and I'd love for Dimitri to really get into it. But you know, they say that that the word for for um, for mercy and the word for olive oil are connected, right? In in the ancient Greek. Now, I've heard some people say that that's probably a folk etymology. I, I'd love to hear whether it's really the case. But either way. I think that that is a helpful image for us, at least, of what mercy is like, right? It is like oil, it is like a soothing balm. It cleans us, it can purify, um, it can also burn, right? It's all of these things. Um, and this is our response, right, is mercy. Incorp let your kingdom come in this. Right? Here, here the, the image of the blind man Bartimaeus, right, who says in the gospel, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, right? We've taken up that cry, mm -hmm. but we recognize now that he's both son of David and son of God. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, really, all Christian prayer can be reduced to those words, Lord, have mercy, give you mercy, right? Um, what's important, though, and, and this is the thing, the deacon isn't praying. I'm telling you what to pray for. He's announcing on behalf of the angels what the people are to pray for. And the priest is praying their complimentary prayer. He has his own prayers appointed. Hmm. So, the deacon's not praying for these things. The priest isn't praying for these things. 
But it's really, really important that we be praying for these things in the Divine Liturgy. So who's praying for them? You. Right? You. All of the people have to be praying in their hearts for the things that are announced by the deacon and respond from their heart, Lord, have mercy on those, on whatever it is that we're praying for. Because if not, then no one's actually praying for which is why you, you were you were reading the saint story. You sent me the saint story, mm -hmm. and she was saying, like she had the gift of insight, right? And her father stayed home from liturgy one day. Her mother went in a very distracted state, right. all upset. And she said when she came back, Mother, how come you were not praying with the host of heaven like Father was? Because her father, even though he wasn't in the building, had was doing his part. That's what's going wow. on. Ah. Yeah. There's a story about the um, St. Porfirio serving liturgy in a convent. And there was some sister who had been given an obedience to do some work outside of the church during the liturgy. She wasn't able to be there. She was really upset because it was a feast day that she really loved and wanted to serve there. But she went and did it anyway. And the whole time she was crying she couldn't be in the liturgy. And she comes to St. Porfirio's afterwards to confess her, her disappointment and her sorrow. And St. Porfirio's acted surprised. He said, what do you mean? Uh, when I sensed the church and went by your stall, you were standing there every time. Right. Uh, our heart can be there. So it's so important that we not be passive and intently from our hearts for the things that are being proclaimed in these litanies because otherwise it becomes vain it's just empty words it's me up there <laughs> talking you know it's like when I talk to my kids and tell them to go clean their room or lecture them about anything else and they say okay dad and just whoo right in one ear out the other they're not listening in the same way, if the deacon's up there saying, in peace, let us pray to the Lord for the peace from above and for the salvation of our souls, let us pray for, to the Lord and all these other things, and the people aren't praying for these things, then no one is. But with that, though, understand, and this is an important thing to, to realize, no one is a passive observer of the divine liturgy. It's not just that the people are there, but I hope you're seeing a theme in all of this. The people are necessary. Their amen makes up for what is lacking in the priest's prayer. Their Lord have mercy. They're praying in their heart. They're the only ones praying for these things in the liturgy, in a sense. Right? Or first and foremost, the ones praying for these things. Their Lord have mercy is the prayer of the church for these things. Not what the deacon is saying, but what the people are saying is the prayer for these things. Um, I mean, it's one of the interesting things. Most of what the deacon does throughout the divine liturgy is just tell people what to do, right? Very little of it is actually prayer in itself, right? He's saying, right, pray for this and pray for that. Uh, Father, do this. Father, bless that. Father, do this. People, remember the people that you, you know, and Pay so on, right? Pay attention, <laughs> and, right? All of these things, right? The deacon's job is just go around telling everybody what to do, effectively, right? He's, the, he's like the announcer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> which makes sense, because like St. Ignatius says, the deacon is supposed to be like the angels, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes it is the angel's job to pray, and there are places where the deacon does quietly, Right? And we'll talk about that. For example, when, when you see me after the consecration go behind the altar and sense the gifts, um, it is very clearly and explicitly written in that that is when he commemorates the departed and the living by name. Um, so there are places where the deacon prays. Um, but in general, I'm not actually the one doing the praying at all. In that sense. Um, so we have these various petitions, and I, I'm going to resist the urge. We could go into each and every single one of them, but the point is to see 
But this is, when you break it down, a, um, a, a prayer that the kingdom of heaven break through into everything on earth. Right? We cover it all. What you'll also see is, in a certain sense, the concerns that are prayed for in the first part of the liturgy are a little bit more global and a little bit more earthly, in a sense. When we get into the petitions after the great entrance, those petitions become of a more spiritual nature. Okay, there's a shift in emphasis in those petitions in the Divine Liturgy. But at this point, we're still praying for everyone in the world and that the Kingdom of Heaven establish it. One thing that I would point out, um, when this was written, they didn't have the industrial prison complex system that we have in the United States today. They didn't have a judicial uh, you know, corrections and penal system like we have today. We should see this captives much more broadly. We talk about human trafficking, they're captives. We talk about indentured servitude essentially going on today. We talk about people enslaved to debt to student loans, to their mortgage payments, to their car payments, mm -hmm. whatever it might be. Who have no options. Who have no other options. You know, uh, uh, payroll advance loans, right? Loan sharks. Those are all a form of captivity. Mm -hmm. right? But we can also even expand that out and recognize that all of us who struggle with the passions are captive to sin. And so you begin to see how these prayers are, in fact, incredibly broad. Right? Um, and, and expand. And it, um, you know, finally, right, it does get to be um, culminated. The deacon gets one prayer. Help us save us, have mercy on us, and protect us, O oh God, by your grace which is ultimately the, the summary of everything that has just been said. So you're sort of announcing, pray for this, mm -hmm. and also this. Don't forget to pray for this, and then we do it every time right. we say, okay. Right, it's a dialogue. Yeah. It's a dialogue, or, or almost more like a call and response, yeah, right? Yeah, I okay. mean, So it's sort of, exactly. it's sort of like when the two chants being, you have one side and then the other side, it's sort of like that, but it's yeah. people. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Um, or, or even, yeah, I, I'm saying, hey, all of us, let's do this, mm -hmm. and then you do it, mm -hmm. right? And, and yeah, exactly. Um, and it's, it culminates, I find there was a quote here. I wanted to, um, oh, this is one thing that, that he points out. I mean, it's interesting that, you know, praying specifically for this church, for this holy house, and for those who enter it. He says that, um, he says, every time we cross the threshold of the house of God, we are entering, this is a quote from St. John Chrysostom now, um, we are entering a heavenly palace. In its interior, peace reigns, and it is filled with inexpressible mysteries. There, within the divine palace, the mystery of the kingdom of God is celebrated. All mortal flesh falls silent in reverence and awe, so that the mystery of God's word may be heard. We are entering into this divine palace when we enter into the church. It becomes a haven for the soul. Chrysostom goes further, he says, just as a calm and sheltered harbor provides great security to the ships moored there, so does the temple of God. When people enter it, it snatches them away from worldly affairs as from a storm and gives them the, cap the capacity to stand and listen to God's words in calm and security. The place is the bedrock of virtue and the school of spiritual life. You need only set foot on the threshold of a church and at once you are liberated from the cares of daily life. Go on into the church and a spiritual dew will envelop your soul. The stillness there moves you to awe and teaches you how to live spiritually. 
It elevates your thoughts and prevents you from remembering things or matters belonging to the present life. It transports you from earth to heaven. And if there is such a great gain from simply being in a church when no service is going on, then how much benefit will people derive from being present? When the holy apostles proclaim the gospel, Christ stands in our midst. God the Father receives the mysteries that are performed and the Holy Spirit gives his own joy. Um, no wonder we chose you. Yes, right? <laughs> yes, okay. We need this. This is our call to haven. Yes. You know? It's one of the things that really stood out to me that is very different mm -hmm. about church and orthodoxy. That it's not just interesting or congenial to be amongst people who are just jolly or um, but that, that the church is a different place, a place of peace. You walk in and you don't shy away. You know, it's just like right. you can go like that. Right, your soul it, yes. it can can exhale, right? It's tan I but you can feel it. Yeah. Yes. And you know it. I mean Saint John of Shanghai used to talk about going into ancient churches that used to be Orthodox mm -hmm. in Western Europe. And in some of them, he said, you can still feel that sliver of grace that's still there. And then in others, he would say, the grace is gone. It's been mm -hmm. removed and covered over for, by so much, so long neglect. Um, but you can, you know that feeling walk into an Orthodox church, wherever it may be, yeah, your soul can just breathe out, right? St. Yermanoah says, after the rite of consecration, you no longer call the church simply a house, but holy, because it has been sanctified by the Holy Father through the All-Holy Son, in the Holy Spirit, and is the house of the Holy Trinity. But as St. Nicholas Cabasulus and St. John Chrysostom Go further, they say, we then too, by entering into this house and worshiping, become temples ourselves. Right? And St. Paul says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? We are strengthened in that and become those temples and bear the presence of Christ himself to the world as we need. Um, it's my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, as I do. That's right. Um, you'll notice in every service that we commemorate our Archbishop, right? Because again, he is that, that point of unity within the church. Right? In every litur and it's and it goes up. In every liturgy, we commemorate our Archbishop. In every liturgy, he commemorates his patriarch and the Synod. And in every liturgy, the Patriarch commemorates the Synod. Mm -hmm. And usually the other Patriarchs as well. Right? So there's this principle of, you know, where is our source of unity not, kind of not on me, in the connection? But, it's not on me. But beyond me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so right. this piece, when we're praying for peace, part of it is this piece that we're in right now, we're, we're praying to, to take it with us and we're praying yeah. that it go through us and onto it to all these other parts of our, of our world and our e life. Exactly, uh, exactly. Yeah. Right. Let, let your peace be present here. Let your peace be present in me. And then through the church. You know, it's interesting, everything is collective. You will not find a reference to a personal, personal relationship with Jesus Christ anywhere in the Bible. It's all about the church's relationship to Christ and my relationship to, the, to Christ and, and to the church, right? I'm identified with Christ, but my relationship is with Christ through the church. And this is borne out throughout Acts, throughout the New Testament, right? And the way that Paul writes to the churches the way that St. John writes, is instructed to write to the churches in Revelation. It is a corporate thing. And so again, even then, it's not just the peace that's on me, mm -hmm. it's the peace that is in us would go out to the world, exactly. right? It's a collective thing. Um, I mean, yes, me individually too, right? I have to play my part in that, otherwise yeah. I, you know, I'm like the guy playing out of sync in the symphony. But, but um, 
but it's not just on you. Right? It's not a solo act. Um, Good reminder. I'm different. I need to hear yeah. this stuff. Yeah. yeah. It's all of us. Um, you know, and, and to that point, right? Um, The epistle to Diognetus, this is early on. Christian believers live in their own homelands, but as temporary visitors. They live on earth, but behave as if they are in heaven. They love all and are persecuted by all. In a word, what the soul is to the body, Christians are to the world. We are the life mm -hmm. of Christ in the world. The soul is diffused through all the members of the body as Christians are in all the cities of the world. Christians sustain the world. Christ is low, I am with you always until the end of the age. And what is his presence in the world? It is the church, that mystical body of Christ that St. Paul talks about. And so as the soul is the living life of the body, the church, the Christians are to every part of the world. Right? It's an incredible thing to think about. I mean, to your point, right? It's, it's both an incredible calling for each of us, but also an incredible responsibility. So I tell the kids in the Sunday school, like, what are the monastics doing? Like, that kind of stuff about the monastics, but it's, it's just us, all of us. Okay. It's all of us. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're doing it in a unique and intense way, but they're not doing anything different than what we're called to do as well. So this is part of when they say, you know, you have married people running families and lives and you have monastics and it's the same thing, actually. This exactly. is part of why that is. It's all, because ultimately it's all the life of Christ, mm -hmm. right? It is the life of Christ in the world, mm -hmm. in me and in the world. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I remember, I mean, sort of to that point, a little bit of a quip, I remember talking to an abbot one time, and I made, I don't remember, but I made some point about monastic spirituality being more intense or he looked at me and he said, monks, those are those hermits in the deserts. We're just a bunch of guys trying to be Christian here. But then he went on to make the point. He said, there are no different spiritualities. In Orthodoxy, we don't talk about, you know, in, in the Catholic Church, you'll hear about mm -hmm. Dominican spirituality or Franciscan spirituality or Marian spirituality or this or that and all these different spiritualities, right? And in the Orthodox Church, we don't talk that way because it's Christ, right? It is the life of Christ. And we might find that there are different manner, there, there might be a different manner to how you live that out in this place, in this time, and in these circumstances, but it's the same thing that you're living out. You just might be taking a different tack for how you do it compared to somebody who lives in the desert. but it's all the same thing. It's the Beatitudes, right? I mean, that's the Sermon on the Mount. That's Christian spirituality, and it doesn't matter what label you put to it or where you're living um, or what your job or your vocation or your married status or your family life might be, we're called to live the Beatitudes, which is ultimately the kingdom of Christ. So, maybe we'll conclude here then, um, which is the priest's prayer that he's saying quietly while these petitions are being prayed. The priest then says, Lord our God, whose dominion is incomparable and glory incomprehensible, whose mercy is immeasurable and love for mankind ineffable, look upon us and upon this holy house in your loving kindness, and grant to us and to those who pray with us your abundant mercy and compassion. For to you belong our glory, honor, and worship to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever in the ages of ages. And we will then say, Amen. Um, you'll notice that this is complementary to what we're praying in the litanies. It's, you know, different words, 
say it a little bit differently, but essentially praying for the same thing. That's sort of the end then of that, that first set of petitions, and then we can start talking about the Psalms next time. So, any other questions then about this very beginning part? Thank you. No, 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 no. I don't want to talk so much. No, I'm glad. I'm, I'm really glad for it. But uh, it's so helpful. Oh, uh, goodness. Other questions or thoughts? All right. We'll go ahead then. Jesus, having risen from the grave as he foretold, has granted us eternal life and the great mercy.